Alright, I am back with another video and today we're doing yet another deity build and this one is one of the most popular requests of all time, Saluna. Now, technically I've already done a Saluna build on the challenge before, uh, on the challenge, on the channel. Uh, if you've seen my Shadow Heart Origin build, which I highly recommend you check out, you'll know that that build had separate uh, kind of pathways you could take depending on, on if you wanted to pick uh, Shah or Salune as your chosen deity. I hope I'm pronouncing it by the way, Saluna. No, it's Saluna. I said Salune. Don't ask me why. So, uh, technically I've done this already, but I wanted to take another crack at it because I didn't consider that an actual deity build more than I did a uh, Shadow Hearts build, and I kind of wanted to take this opportunity to lean into some other aspects of, well, Saluna's faith. And I think I've come up with something pretty interesting. Now, this was made as a community effort. I did have some help with this build over on my live stream. However, the last live stream we did wasn't like the others. We didn't really figure out all of the equipment and we deliberated back and forth for a very long time about what the overall class structure should be. Because there's so many different aspects to Saluna that are hard to cover in a single build, so I've decided to make this a duo build. What this duo build is basically going to cover is a couple of aspects of Saluna. One, the moon, the kind of, and as such I've kind of modelled these characters after the full moon and the new moon, one being a front-facing kind of tanky fighter and the other being more of a spellcaster support character. And the spellcaster support character is what we're mainly going to be focusing on here as they are slightly more complex than the front facing character and the kind of ideas that we're going for here is that Saluna's natures are twilight which we don't have life and knowledge so while I've mainly focused on the life domain here knowledge would absolutely work as well if you wanted to go for a slightly different playstyle and theming and I'm kind of leaning into the slightly nature aspect of Saluna as well she is the patron of lycanthropes and so I wanted to include a little bit of that here so this will take some inspirations from a couple of other D&D stuff uh, and classes such as ranger and druid and you'll kind of see where I'm going with this also for those of you who were a part of the stream this build is going to be a little bit different than what we discussed, but I promise you it will make sense. So, we're going to be kicking things off as a life cleric. This makes total sense for the build. I mean, we're going to be getting Saluna based dialogue by having her as our deity. We also get to pick the life domain subclass, which means we're going to be a pretty effective healer build. But of course, if you wanted to go with knowledge domain instead, for something a little bit different, you absolutely can. But in my opinion, life does make the most sense, and we can kind of make an interesting support build here. As for our cantrips, I'm going to be taking uh, these, no, I think, yeah, no, we'll keep them at base. Sacred Flame makes sense, it's just going to be kind of a okay radiant damage cantrip. I mean, a lot of people have problems with this just not hitting, and I can totally see why. And as such, we're going to also be going with Guidance and Resistance. As for our ability scores, they, this is not what they look like, the game has reset them. Let me just fix that real quick for us. There we go. So, eight. We have an eight in strength and charisma because we don't really need those stats, and we're already going to have a more charismatic character here. Wisdom is at sixteen for obvious reasons; it's our main spellcasting stat. Intelligence is at twelve because I kind of felt like putting intelligence on this character when we already have a character that has decent charisma. Constitution at sixteen for decent HP and saving throws on our concentration, and dexterity at fourteen just for a bit of extra AC. Although it's not really our primary stat here, we are going to be using something else. As for our skill proficiencies, we can go for... Uh, we I've gone with the Acolyte background here, so we're already getting Religion and Insight. We gain Perception because this character is a High Elf, it's just kind of what I decided to go with. So our only options left to us are History, Medicine and Persuasion. Again, we're not really a charismatic character, so Medicine and History feel like the natural picks here. At level two, now you can multi-class because we have kind of an even 6-6 six, six split on the multi-classing here. So if you wanted to take the, our other class now, you could, but I'm just going to be showcasing them in order. It depends on what aspects of the build you want to get first. So I'm just going to show off Cleric first and then our multi-class later. So with level two of Life Cleric, we're going to get a couple of things. Turn Undead, which is perfect for us, but mainly Preserve Life, basically giving us a flat healing spell kind of spell, I guess, 
but uses our channel divinity charge. By the time we're at our max cleric level, this will be healing 36 damage, which is really nice just as a flat heal with no variance in what gets healed. So if you really just need a solid amount of recovery, you're going to get it from this. As for our prepared spells, we're going to get a few, and there are some very obvious picks here. Uh, Sanctuary obviously is going to allow us to protect ourselves if we want to focus solely on support or protect an ally if we so choose but the only difference is is that we obviously can't deal damage to people so you kind of have to pick and choose when you want to play support and when you want to play offensive however we will have a slight way of getting around that guiding bolt is our next one is basically just a good range damage spell deals radiant damage and makes the uh, target have advantage on the next attack roll against them, so, you know, can help buff our other guy here. Obviously, Healing Word, we want more healing. Shield of Faith can be a decent concentration spell at this level. And finally, Command is another good favourite of mine. At Cleric level 3, we get to pick some level 2 spells. And I think I can see us grabbing Warding Bond here. Again, this is a duo build, so the Cleric character having Warding Bond does make sense. If we really want to go into that kind of support role, obviously this means we are going to be taking our damage ourselves. So we will have to be a bit careful, but our, and our other build is already pretty tanky, but it just feels thematically appropriate to have this. But if you don't particularly care for it, hold person, prayer of healing, they can all work. At cleric level four, we get to pick an extra cantrip and I'm going to pick up Thaumaturgy. As for our kind of other spells here, you can take another level two spell if you like. It's entirely up to you. Uh, as for our feet here, I'm going to be going with an ability score improvement and bumping up that wisdom. Uh, wisdom for us is obviously our main spellcasting stat. It's also going to affect how much we can heal people, so we want this up as high as we can get it. At cleric level 5, we are going to be getting access to level 5 spells. We get destroy undead, which is always nice, allowing us to deal radiant damage when we use our turn undead feature. We're also going to be getting a couple of nice life domain spells here, and beacon of hope and revivify. And we also get to pick some other spells too, namely spirit guardians, because of course we are, and mass healing word, because it's a pretty damn good healing spell. I am also going to point out glyph of warding, because it has a unique bit of thematic synergy with this build. Glyph of warding allows you to set an an arcane trap on the floor that when it is stepped on it will explode with either damage or a certain effect. Uh, in the case of us here the glyph of warding which actually can be cast defensively as well if you just cast it on a net where an enemy is already standing it just goes off immediately. There is a glyph of warding for sleep and Saluna kind of has a thing about sleep so it kind of makes sense to go with that. So yeah decent selection of level 3 spells here. Next up at Life Cleric 6, we are going to get our final sort of cleric stuff for this build. We get another Channel Divinity Charge, which is another Preserve Life, which is always nice. And we're also going to be getting Blessed Healer, allowing us to, whenever we heal someone with a healing spell of level 1 or higher, we also regain hit points equal to uh, 2 plus the spell's level. So it's a nice little bit of extra healing for us as well. Lots of good stuff with Life Cleric, lots of different healing options. We're basically going to be able to keep ourselves and our party alive quite easily. We also do get to put another prepared spell on our build here, and honestly take whatever you like, it really doesn't matter. We could take Daylight here and kind of say it's Moonlight, I guess, uh, basically allowing us to enchant an item uh, or make a sphere of light with the spell's darkness around it, so it could be useful sometimes. Vampires beware. <laughs> now, from here, you have a choice. You can do what I and the members of our community originally decided to do, and just build pretty much a straight life cleric, or taking a dip in fighter for a fighting style or something like that. But I decided to go with something a little bit different. I really wanted to lean into that lycanthropy, nature side of things for this build. And as such, we are going to be taking a multi-class here for the rest of this build. And it's probably pretty obvious what we're going for. We're going with Druid. Druid is going to give us a bunch of stuff to kind of lean into that nature aspect of Saluna's faith. So let, we're going to pick up a few things from this, namely a couple of cantrips. And I'm going to be swapping out Shillelagh for uh, Produce Flame for now. That's why I didn't take it earlier in case some of you were confused. Uh, that's going to give us a nice decent little fire cantrip and Thorn Whip to be able to pull enemies closer to us. We are going to get some extra spells. We already have the healing spells from uh, Life Cleric, so we might as well pick up some damage and utility options. Speak with Animals, Long Strider, Enhanced Sleep, I would say Thunder Wave, and probably Ice Knife are all really good options for us here. Next up, we get to choose our subclass, and I think I would be fairly 
stupid if I didn't take Circle of the Moon. We're literally worshipping a goddess of the moon, it makes total sense. Circle of the Moon is going to allow us to do quite a few different things. It's going to augment our wild shape, allowing us to do it as a bonus action. We're going to get unique wild shapes, such as the bear wild shape, but we're also going to be able to get the normal wild shape of the wolf. Uh, slight spoilers for Shadowheart's backstory here, but she does have a pretty important connection to wolves, and there's a decent reason for it, and it makes sense for us to have this wild shape. So, I having this is nice, it's great for the theme, obviously there are more powerful wild shapes out there, especially when we're only going to be able to reach level 6 of Moondurid. However, with some of our equipment and other features, we are going to be able to maintain this form pretty easily regardless anyway. So, let's keep going. We're also going to get Luna Mend, allowing us to expend spell slots to regain hit points while we're in wild shape as a bonus action, so we can attack, attack, and then heal ourselves. Kind of on theme with the whole healing Saluna build here, life domain and all that. I well, The more I kind of think about it, Circle of the Moon definitely has a lot of connections to Saluna, stuff that I wouldn't originally have thought of. And it makes sense why Halson is so uh, kind of heavily connected to Saluna. He mentions her quite a bit if not talking about Sylvanas. So it's kind of interesting. I didn't realize the actual implications or thematic connection to Saluna here, so it's quite nice. As for our prepared spells, we do get an extra one. Uh, the game's picked up in Tangle for us, so sure, why not? But you can pick up anything you like here. In fact, actually, no. Fairy Fire little moon motes or moonlight or whatever you want to call it. I don't know. I want moonlight. That's basically it. <laughs> Speaking of moonlight, the main, one of the main reasons I wanted to come to Druid is at level three where we get to pick up moonbeam. Yeah, you didn't think I was going to make a Saluna build without getting moonbeam, right? <laughs> that would have been pretty stupid of me, huh? Anyways, moonbeam is going to allow us to uh, basically cast a big radiant moonbeam, I guess, from the heavens to smite down our opponents. It stays stationary on the field and anyone who walks into it is going to take 2d10 radiant damage and this can scale up with spell slots. Go to level 6 with this and they're taking like 6d10 radiant damage, which is pretty powerful. But there's actually an interesting synergy here. So moonbeam stays on the field, right? And as an action on subsequent turns, you can move the beam around up to 18 meters. So here's the thing. If you're under Sanctuary, meaning you can't be hit, you're technically not attacking when you move your Moonbeam. So you can remain in Sanctuary and just move your Moonbeam around and nobody can touch you for it. So overall, it's a pretty interesting combo. A little bit cheesy, but I thought I'd, it would be remiss if I didn't point it out. So yeah, quite happy to pick up Moonbeam here. I might also train out Thunderwave here for Spike Growth. You know me, I like my uh, Battlefield control. So it's quite nice to pick it up when we can. Next up at Druid level 4, we're going to get some extra Wild Shape forms like the Dire Raven and the Deep Rothe. We're also going to get another Cantrip here, and Shillelagh can actually work for us, as believe it or not, we are using a club with this build. It's just not the main focus. We also are going to get an Ability Score Improvement here, and of course I'm going to bump up that Wisdom because, well... It's just, it powers everything we do. And if we are using Wild Shape fairly frequently, then our physical stats don't matter as much. But this build is more designed to be able to go in and out of Wild Shape as much as we like and gain benefits from either or. So I wanted to still have my physical stats be decent, but we definitely want that wisdom maxed out. At Moon Druid level 5, we're going to be able to get Wild Strike, allowing us to basically have extra attack while Wild Shaped, which is pretty good, as well as we're going to be able to pick up level 3 spells from this point. The first one I'm going to recommend is Plant Growth. It's one of my favourite spells. This doesn't require concentration. For some reason up till now, I thought it did, but I noticed in my house and build that it doesn't, so hey-ho. And it allows, and it makes it so any creature moving through it has their movement speed quartered, which is nice. We can also pick up Daylight here, but we already have it. So I'd say maybe pick up some level 2 stuff, a Flame blade could be fun if you're not too into using the equipment that I've provided. We've got other spell options here, there's quite a few. We could pick up a good berry, because who doesn't like a snick? And then finally, at Druid level 6 and total level 12, we're going to be getting our final Druid features here. Namely, Primal Strike, allowing our Wild Shape attacks to overcome uh, resistance and immunity to non-magical damage, and we also gain the Panther and Owlbear forms. If you're not caring about which Wild Shape form you choose, so if you're not if you're not too into using just the wolf, you can absolutely go for Owlbear here, as, as in, it is my favourite Wild Shape, and in my opinion, one of the most powerful and just kind of fun to use. So if you just need a tanky Wild Shape and you just need it to take, be able to take some hits and deal some damage, then Owlbear is your go-to. And we also get an extra prepared spell at this level. Take whatever you like. We've basically got everything we want at this point anyway. 
And that is the build. Overall, you're going to be getting a ton of versatility out of it. You will be able to heal. You will be able to wild shape for tankiness and attacking. You'll be able to enable strategies like Moonbeam Sanctuary to be able to kind of cheese battle the battle a bit, allowing you to be a full support character while also being able to consistently deal damage and keep yourself safe. We're also keeping in theme with Saluna, being able to manipulate people with things like Sleep Fruker for forwarding and another means that I'll get to in a minute. And overall, we're just kind of the best of both worlds when it comes to being a cleric and a druid mix. Uh, definitely capable of being both offensive and supportive, but I like to focus more on the supportive aspect a little bit, but the offensive aspect can definitely come in when necessary. Let's get into the equipment for this build. First up, our weapons, as they are somewhat important. I've gone with the Club of Hill Giant Strength to set our strength to 19, and the Adamantine Shield to prevent critical hits from landing against us. Since we're since my build, uh, my build making process for this build kind of just focused on using a uh, bow here, I decided to just kind of go with that uh so really we're not going to be seeing our melee weapons ever so just we can just have them on uh for the buff here and again having our strength set to 19 is really really nice as well as not having critical hits land against us is just going to give us a bit more survivability but our main weapon that we're going to be using here is at least in the end game is the gone to mail i hope i'm pronouncing that right this is basically just a very very decent bow unfortunately our dexterity isn't the highest and this does use our dexterity so you're not really going to be hitting a lot of hits with this it's mainly just kind of here for the feel of having like this glowing kind of radiant weapon if you wanted to mess around with the stats on this build and get your dexterity higher maybe to a 16 maybe bump it up or something with a few stat boosts in some areas or maybe even equip a different armor piece like something like the uh, graceful cloth to bump this up even higher you absolutely can but we're not really here to fire this one off too much we're mainly going to be focused on casting support cell spells and wild shaping so this is kind of just here because it looks pretty but it does come with some nice effects it glows that's cool it can also inflict Guiding Bolt uh, upon hitting a target, but really we're just going to use Guiding Bolt if we want that effect. It is a plus three weapon, so despite our lower dexterity, you still have a decent chance to hit with it sometimes. But the main thing we can get from it here is Celestial Haste, giving us five turns of haste that even when we drop it, we don't become lethargic. This can only be used once per long rest, but if you for some reason need to go for maybe like a Nova Wild Shape damage round, or you need to get off a ton of healing spells in a single turn to keep your party up, then this is how you do it. Cast haste, and then heal, 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 heal. Uh, it's mainly here for a support option, but if you do want a legitimate damage option uh, that you can acquire a bit earlier in the game, the Titan String Bow is for you. This weapon will deal additional damage equal to your strength modifier, so if for some reason you do want to... Um, you know, focus mainly on the archery, you absolutely can. And in order to and also to help with this, we do have some equipment that can help. Namely the Mask of Soul Perception, giving us a plus two bonus to attack rolls, initiative rolls, and perception checks. Uh, so basically the initiative rolls thing is really, really important, allowing us to get our buffs up early. Perception checks is just a nice bonus, but those bonuses to attack rolls are gonna help us with uh, being able to hit with our bow, again, despite our lower dexterity. The bow isn't the main thing of this build, you can swap this out if you like. And again, this is an Act 3 option, but an earlier game option could be the Marksmanship Hat, giving you just a plus one to ranged attack rolls and thrown attack rolls. So, a slightly worse version of this. We mainly want this for our initiative buffs. Next up is the Mantle of the Holy Warrior. This is just kind of here for flavor. It gives you Crusader's Mantle, which allows you to bless your entire party with an extra 1d4 of radiant damage on their attacks. Uh, we're mainly going to be ha concentrating on other things, but this is quite nice as it kind of gives that whole support vibe to the whole party, buffing, them, buffing their weapons with Saloon as Moonlight. Felt pretty good. Uh, as for our armor, I've gone with the Armor of moon basking this is going to give us 22 temporary hit points when we're in wild shape and while those te uh temporary hit points are active we reduce all incoming damage by one so this is just going to give our wild shapes a bit more tankiness allowing that part of the strategy to be a bit more viable and also while we are in wild shape we have a plus two to our bonus to our armor class oh well that's actually both in and out of wild shape and we have advantage on saving throws against spells that effect persists well, we're in wild shape. So overall, it's just going to get make us a lot more tanky, giving us much many more chances to dodge and um, advantage on saving throws, which is really nice. This is basically just here to make our wild shape again a bit more viable, especially into the end game. Combining this with owl bear, and you'll be totally fine. But the wolf will get some survivability out of it as well. Uh, this is an Act 3 option, though. Up until that point, kind of just use whatever light to medium armor you can find. Uh, the Act 1 Adamantine stuff can really, really work here. Figure out what works best for you. 
Next up, the Gloves of Archery. I kind of picked these up because I've never, I don't really show them off enough. This allows us to gain proficiency with longbows and shortbows, as well as adding an additional two damage to our ranged weapon attacks. Again, with the kind of archer vibe that I'm going for here, it kind of made sense to kind of buff them up a little bit. Again, might want to make your dexterity a bit higher if you want to completely focus. <coughs> that sneeze came out of nowhere. I'm not keeping that in because that was rancid and it will probably burst out eardrums. <laughs> so I decided to include these because, you know, I haven't really shown them off before. I mean, an additional two damage is nice and the proficiency with the longbows is great. Uh, I mean, you don't... Again, this is if you want to focus more on the bow stuff, you might want to bump up that dexterity a bit, but it's entirely up to you. And finally, we have the Boots of Speed. As a kind of arch... as Again, as a kind of like ranged support kind of archer build, it makes sense to be able to maneuver around the battlefield as much as you can, so having a bonus action dash can be really useful for getting you out of sticky situations or getting need, or getting you in range of where you need to be on larger battlefields. Might not come up all the time, you can replace this with something else if you like, but I felt like it was a pretty decent option to include. As for our accessories, here we have the Amulet of Saloon as Chosen. This is here because... Of course I was going to include it. This is about me being like the chosen of a deity, so, you know, the amulet of Saloon is chosen makes sense. It's going to give you a cantrip, which means which is kind of a special cantrip. You can use it once per long rest. It's called Saloon's Dream. It does a D8 of healing, and an ally you touch regain hit, hit, regains hit points but possibly falls asleep. Again, this is here purely for flavor. Replace this if you like. And finally, this kind of standard healing combo when it comes to rings, the Ring of Salving to restore an additional two hit points every time we heal another creature, and the Whispering Promise to whenever we heal the creature, it gains a 1d4 bonus to attack rolls and saving throws. This includes both our allies and ourselves. But if you perhaps don't care about the Ring of Salving, since we are doing a wild shape build for Shapeshifter's Boon Ring, it could be nice. Gaining a plus d4 bonus to all checks while shapeshifting or disguising yourself, this includes wild shape, and is a pretty standard part of most Moon Druid kits, so it's just a nice buff to all of your checks while you're wild shaped so yeah i mean that is this build um this is mainly just again meant to be kind of a thematic uh you know support wild shape build that kind of explores all aspects of saluna's faith well most of them at least maybe not so much the knowledge cleric aspect again it's kind of just it kind of takes inspiration from things like ranger where you get to be a bit of an archer as well uh you get all the healing spells and such like that we get moonbeam so we have the whole moon theme here we get radiant damage we just get a lot of stuff here to make us an overall kind of versatile member of the team so i quite like it here again this could also be used for shadow heart if you don't care to make your own extra character for this it's entirely up to you. This build will work with her quite nicely. As for our other character here, the camera has fucked off into shadow space. We have... Oh, and it's doing weird things again now. Come on, play ball. This is a fairly simple character. I wanted. We couldn't decide if we wanted to make this build a paladin or a cleric or something in between. So we decided to make this a duo build and we really like the theming of this big important, you know, cleric of Saluna having a paladin guardian. Yes, I know this is very similar to Aelin and um, Isabel in the game already, but just humor me, all right? This is what we came up with, and I'm actually quite proud of what I was able to come up with here. Now, again, because usually when I make these duo or full party builds, I like to keep the kind of sub builds a bit simpler. This is what we ended up choosing. Level 11 paladin, level 1 life cleric. We went with life cleric because, again, that's the domain, but knowledge or war would be perfectly fine as well. Knowledge, uh, knowledge to keep in the uh, uh, domains of Saluna, but then uh, War would just give you extra bonus action attacks three times per long rest, which is always nice, so feel free to choose that if you like. The only reason we're really taking a dip into Cleric is for the dialogue options, so feel free to change that about if you like. But the main thing we're going here is to level 11 a Paladin, and we're getting Ancients Paladin. Again, feeding into that nature theming, and, you know, just really, I don't know, <laughs> How else to explain it? We wanted the nature theming. It felt perfect for Saluna. We're still getting that radiant damage boost. O Oath of Ancients Paladin even gets Moonbeam as well, which is really, really nice. So we can have Moonbeam on both of our characters. We're going to get Aura of Warding, allowing us to protect our allies from spells. Uh, we get Aura of Protection and Aura of Courage, which all feel great. We even get healing options through Lay on Hands and Healing Radiance. And Lay on Hands does 
quite a lot of healing actually. So it all fits in the similar kind of theme, being a, but instead of being more of a support character, we're more of a tanky fighter with a bit of healing to boot, as well as the kind of moon theming and the radiant damage from moonbeam and things like divine smite. So the main kind of build aspect here comes from the equipment. We have the Holy Lance Helm. The whole theme I kind of went for with this build was a kind of if you hit me you're going to get punished type of vibe, or I guess if you attack me. The Holy Lance Helm allows us to anytime a creature misses an attack roll against us, which happen fairly often because we're going to have decent AC, uh, they have to make a dex save or take radiant damage, so it's kind of a little moonlight retaliation. I've gone with the Cloak of Protection here to round out our uh, armor class because our armor here is a heavy armor called the Rippling Force Mail. This is going to, this, I kind of chose this because, again, I wanted to do something a little bit different. You could pick much more powerful options, but I wanted to show this off. The Rippling Force Mail is unique as it is a piece of heavy armor that gets force conduit. Force conduit reduces bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage against the affected entity, uh, by one per turn remaining. So it's gonna make you very, very tanky. And we gain with this armor force conduit whenever we take slashing, piercing, or bludgeoning damage. So we're just gonna make ourselves even more resistant to those damage types. And if the entity, and if we take damage while we have five or more turns of force conduit remaining, we deal one D4 force damage in a six meter radius. So we're basically just gonna be able to retaliate a little bit while making ourselves even more tanky, which is really nice. Unfortunately, this armor only has a 17 armor class at base, which is not ideal. So we're gonna be using a shield as well as the cloak of protection to bump it up to a 20. As for our gloves, we have the bone spike gloves. Again, just kind of another interesting glove that I wanted to show off that I don't really do a lot, which means our attacks now ignore resistance to slashing, piercing, and bludgeoning damage. I didn't realize until I started testing builds more actively in Act 3 how important being able to overcome resistance is, so this is going to make us a much more effective frontline fighter. And finally, the Boots of Striding. Whenever we cast a spell that requires concentration, hence Moonbeam, uh, we gain momentum, which makes us a little bit faster, so we'll be able to close in on our enemies a bit easier. And while we are concentrating, we cannot be knocked prone or moved against our will. And if we can't be knocked prone, that means we can't lose concentration from being knocked prone. So fuck you, Steel Watchers. <laughs> Get bent. Uh, as for our accessories, we have the Spell Savant Amulet, which is going to give us a level 2 spell slot pretty much constantly, which means an extra Divine Smite. Killer's Sweetheart, which is a ring I recommend for all paladins, and basically allows you to have a critical, after killing an enemy, you basically have a critical hit in the bank that you can spend whenever you like, and if you know how paladins work with critical hits, you'll know that it is very, very strong getting that extra Divine Smite damage. And finally, the Ring of Free Action to ignore the effects of difficult terrain and cannot be paralyzed or restrained. Again, I kind of see this character as a veritable tank, you know, protecting their cleric charge with their life, and as such, nothing will stop them from being able to be their shield. Speaking of shields, we have a couple of options here. I've been showing off the Swire's sled board here, because this will give us force conduit at the start of each turn in combat. So we have a passive way of building up force conduit as well, instead of just being hit. But if you're not too into that, as again, I can kind of see this shield not really looking very good fashion-wise. The Shield of Devotion also exists, and the Shield of Devotion is going to give you an ever extra level 1 spell slot, another smite, as well as a casting of aid at level 3 to give you a little bit of extra HP. So, either or, pick your poison. But of course, the main weapon we're going for here is Saluna's Spear of Night, because of course we are. Saluna's so Spear of Night is going to give us a ton of amazing things. We gain advantage on wisdom saving throws and perception checks. Nice. Uh, we can see in the dark up to 12 meters. This character is a human, actually, so that's quite nice to have. It's a plus three spear, and it also gives us a level three casting of Moonbeam once per long rest, which is the highest we would normally be able to cast it anyway, only having level three spell slots. So being able to get it without expending our precious smite resources is very nice. We also get a unique class action called Moon Mode, which allows us to illuminate the area with wisps of moonish light that make a di it difficult for enemy to, to make movement difficult for your enemies and bolster your allies' damage. Sorry, I completely missed uh, where I was reading there. At the start of the their turn, each hostile creature within the light must succeed a wisdom saving throw, or they must treat the lighted area as difficult terrain, and each ally within the light deals an additional 1d4 radiant damage. We have a lot of ways of stacking radiant damage buffs with this build between Moon Moat, Divine Favor, 
uh, moonbeam, all sorts of things. You can really create a radiant hellscape for your enemies if you know what you're doing. And the spear does pretty decent damage anyway. So with the paladin, we did take the dueling feat since we are going for sword and shield and spear here. A bit of a hoplite. So, you know, it makes sense since we're wielding the spear in one hand to get a little bit of extra damage out of it. And again, again, all of that's ignoring resistance, so we're going to be a pretty effective martial fighter. And I keep forgetting to do this in builds, so I'll quickly show this stuff off. Now, as for the kind of clothing for this build, as you can see, I have modded camp clothing here. This is coming from the extra gear as camp clothing mod, and I'll quickly show them off. This is the Selenite plate armor, which is kind of like a mod um, slightly modified version of Dame Aelin's plate armor, as well as the Selenite plate boots. These are both colored in the Night Singer die from the Boring Die Pack mod. Speaking and going back over to our cleric build here, similar sort of thing here. We have a Selenite robe kind of modified look here, slightly more combat ready version with the Harper boots, again from the same mods and colored with the same die. Uh, so yeah, that is the builds. Multiple. Overall, what you're getting out of these builds is a nice little thematic duo, both focused on kind of spreading the moonlight with a bit of nature theming, lots of radiant damage, and kind of differing playstyles, one being support, one being a tank. Uh, I've kind of done this concept before in various different ways. My Mia Leckie's Guardians video was a duo build that had a barbarian and a wild shaped druid which kind of had a similar theming to it as well uh whenever i do do a build i kind of like to have this like theming that kind of makes sense but the, each build kind of plays differently with the exception of the twins in time build which were very very similar to each other but i really am kind of happy with how this turned out especially after how we were deliberating over it for so long on stream and never really came to a proper conclusion i think the thematic and mechanical sides of both of these builds are quite strong and are going to make for a really fun playthrough depending on which one you want to play as again you kind of have the charismatic paladin that can work as the face of the party as well as the kind of cleric who can do things like cast formaturgy and threat friends since i went with high elf and took friends as the cantrip so you basically could play either or of these characters as your main character and it would go fine. My personal pick would be the Paladin uh, as the actual kind of main character for Tav, as it were, but either or will work. And you'll see in the combat footage that's kind of playing at the moment uh, that these builds are very, very effective. They were able to keep each other alive, deal tons of damage, utilize multiple strategies, and being able to take out, you know, this kind of pretty tough group of enemies. Uh, as for end of video stuff, uh, my last video that I uploaded as of this recording, The Wandering Swordmaster, that did very well. That's one of my more popular recent builds. It's kind of helping to get this chat to get this channel kind of out of the uh, algorithmic rut that it was in after I had to take my unfortunate hiatus due to strap. And as such, the channel is definitely starting to get back into normal. But there's a couple of things I wanted to address as there have been some concerns with the channel. Modded builds, uh, what exactly is happening with those? Uh, as I said, they are going to be a Sunday series. And while I was kind of leaning more towards them in terms of like content that I want to do in the future, I've decided that they're not going to replace vanilla content. You're going to get one modded build a week on a Saturday. I'm going to move it from Sunday to Saturday and that's it. There is still plenty to explore in the base game and I want to keep most of my builds vanilla as that is where I do think a lot of the fun is for a lot of people. But maybe when Larian comes out with that modding support, then I might change my tune a bit but it will all depend on what mods are available on console because that's again kind of what i'm trying to help build with as for other stuff uh kind of something weird's been going on and i kind of have to say i'm a little bit worried my computer's been very strange lately i might have installed a virus or something or i don't know it's, it's something's weird uh sometimes my pc i'll it'll like flicker and go a bit weird and like you know, my mouse will move on its own and stuff like that. I can't quite understand it. I'm still hoping to stream this weekend. My stream is going to be at Saturday, uh, this Saturday, uh, March the 24th, I believe, at 1 p.m. UK time, 23rd, 24th, one of the two. I'm hoping the stream will go all right, but with these computer problems that I've been having, uh, I don't know. I can't really explain it. It's so strange. I don't know what's going on with my PC. I'm going to have to investigate it a bit further. I'm hoping nothing is broken, but... Well, we'll just have to see. <laughs> Who knows? Worst comes to worst. Maybe if I stream, some of you guys can help me with tech support. <laughs> uh, anyways, thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you all next time.